and Cancer Institute Hospital. And uh, it's a great pleasure for us uh, to welcome you all uh, to this panel. And it's an honor for me to host uh, Professor Dr. Abbas and also my colleague in Cancer Institute Hospital, uh, Dr. Safar. Uh, Dr. Safar, I think you are with us. Uh, would you turn on your webcam? Are you with us, Dr. Safar? Okay, great. Hello. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Hello. Thank you. Uh, it's, I think, uh, we can get started the webinar. First of all, I would like to uh, introduce Professor Dr. Abbas Agemi. He is Professor and Chair of Institute of Pathology, Friedrich Alexander University, Erlangen, Nuremberg University Hospital in Erlangen. Uh, no need to more introduction because he has more than, uh, I think, 500 publications in um, um, pathologic lesions and uh, especially in head and neck regions and he's well experienced uh, in head and neck regions. Uh, Professor Abbas, thank you very much for accepting our invitation to this webinar and uh, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you, Puya, and very much for the kind invitation. I don't see any images, Noah, only my uh, presentation. Yes, would you please reshare your uh, screen? Uh, yes, now I see. Uh, okay, I will then go back to the screen. No, I don't know. It is uh, always uh, uh, hidden when I have the oh. full PowerPoint presentation, which is a new thing for me. So I don't know what is the problem. But anyway, I don't think I need that. I just uh, will start just in the sake of Sorry, time. sorry, I'm interrupting. Uh, please, uh, Professor, exit the full screen, full screen mode in your slide. Yes, and when I have the full screen, I cannot see the videos. No, no, exit, exit from the full screen mode. So now uh, you can reshape your uh, PowerPoint and then uh, make it full screen. Now just again, yes. Okay, then I have to know exactly the same thing. But I think it's no problem. I don't know what... Uh, something is just masking uh, the other, but it is not really a problem because uh, I, what I need now to see is just my presentation. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for the kind and honorable invitation to contribute to this series of webinars uh, uh, on head and neck pathology and uh, hoping that the next time it will be a present seminar in, in your beautiful country. Uh, I was asked to tell something about spindle cell lesions of the head and neck, and uh, as we know that, and I discussed also with you, of course, this is a very complicated and heterogeneous uh, topic and with a lot of subtopics, and uh, it is very difficult to cover all these uh, uh, entities in, in, in one talk or one session, so I, I just will try to put them into different subgroups. And now I'm going to just address one group, mainly the mucosal origin lesions and their differential diagnosis. I see that now I, I see the, the videos. Yeah, it appeared very well. Uh, thank you. And so spindle cell lesions in the head and neck can be of mucosal origin. And those mucosal lesions may be either in the oral cavity or other uh, intra oral or pharyngeal and uh, laryngeal sites, as well as in the sinonasal tract. And I omitted the sinonasal lesions because there we have a specific set of entities that are almost limited to this area of the sorry, head and neck. Sorry, oh. Professor. Sorry for interruption. Would you please retry to share your screen because oh, we you cannot don't see it? No, no, we cannot see that. 
Ah, uh, sorry. I think there is some. Uh, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now you see the full screen. Yes, it's great. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Sorry, there is something wrong. Okay, so. Uh, as I said, just uh, anatomic wise, I, I classify or I subcategorize these lesions into those of mucosal origin, including sinonasal and other or non sinonasal sites. We have, of course, the odontogenic lesions, benign, malignant, and reactive. This is also very heterogeneous category of lesions. I will not try to touch it now uh, because of time. Skin based uh, and subcutaneous lesions will be as uh, we discussed covered in another talk. So now I am going just to focus on those intraoral lesions, uh, soft tissue and bone lesions, just to, to highlight the most important uh, messages that we have to take uh, with us from this uh, discussion. So if we think about benign spindle cell lesions in the head and neck, we know that they are uncommon individually, but as a group or as a heterogeneous category, they are not really that rare. So we every day maybe see one lesion. The problem is that similar to soft tissue pathology, every one lesion is different from the next one. So this is always the problem why uh, it is difficult to build up a good experience with them because they are a very heterogeneous and the individual entities are relatively uncommon or even rare. We know that they range from reactive uh, tumor-like uh, or tumefactive lesions to benign neoplasm with defined genetic basis frequently. Uh, some have predilection even for the head and neck and this is always important. Sometimes uh, we ignore these demographic features and indeed these are very important because in specific demographic context, sometimes we do not need to consider some entities at all. And on the other hand, we have to think very importantly of some lesions when we know the age and the site of the lesion, etc. cetera. Uh, diagnosis essentially is similar to other sites if these are lesions that are ubiquitous. However, there are sometimes some morphological peculiarities that we encounter in the head and neck compared to other sites and these might represent the source of a diagnostic error. Uh, essentially, we use the same pattern of analysis as in soft tissue pathology. When we are dealing with any mesenchymal or possible mesenchymal uh, lesion, we have to use the same criteria. Uh, essentially, however, as I said, the peculiarity is that in the head and neck, we frequently are dealing with mucosal lying organs or cavities. So, the epithelial nature is very likely in many of the lesions we are going to encounter. Uh, before making any diagnosis of a sarcoma, we have to be very careful. We have to be sure that we are not dealing with a sarcomatoid or a spindle cell carcinoma, spindle cell sarcomatoid melanoma, or even most important, pseudosarcomatous fibro and myofibroblastic proliferations. And indeed, if we consider these four categories, the three non-sarcoma categories are even much more common than true sarcoma. So this is very important to consider. And this point is very helpful in thinking of a well thought of immunomarker panel when we, we try to reach a diagnosis in a complicated or unclear case. So we know that many of them, it depends on the country you are working on and your resources. However, we rush to immunohistochemistry. Sometimes even before looking at uh, demographic features and even at the clinical history or the basic morphology and any immunohistochemistry out of the classical morphological and demographic context is rather misleading and not helpful anymore. Even sometimes you may make false diagnosis just because you have ordered immunes to chemistry. So uh, we have to adhere to the basics of conventional morphology. I will show you just features of that. We have to help ourselves by the characteristic demographic features of in any individual case. And this is very helpful because 
we can omit many possibilities or differential diagnoses just based on demographic features of the case. Uh, we have also to help ourselves frequently, sometimes very frequently, by using well-selected ancillary tools like histochemistry, immune histochemistry, and sometimes even molecular genetics. From a soft tissue point of view, we have always to put the lesion into one of these different patterns. This is very important. And even sometimes you have to put it into one of these categories before looking at the demographics. Because after doing that, the demographics will help you to have a very minima minimized uh, differential diagnostic list. Are we dealing with a pleomorphic or monotonous lesion? This is very important because if we have bizarre looking pleomorphic and multinucleated cells, this is completely different differential from having a very uniform cytology, irrespective of being benign, of course, or malignant. Then the stromal characteristic, are we dealing with a myxoid stroma? And if yes, is it hypervascularized or posivascular? This is very important. If we are thinking of something like extrasclerotic myxoid chondrosarcoma, then presence of prominent vessel six exclude usually that diagnosis. If we are dealing with uh, myxoid libosarcoma metastasis, which is not very rare, then we have to think of the exact uh, vascular pattern. Sclerosis is sometimes helpful as well. And especially in the head and neck, we have many entities that are very frequently sclerosing, including sarcomatoid carcinoma or spindle cell carcinoma, desmoid fibromatosis, sometimes even keloid uh, and different types of scarring as well as some uh, benign mesenchymal neoplasm. Fat-containing lesions are another category that is sometimes very uh, complicated because frequently we have something that looks well circumscribed with scattered uh, single fat cells. However, these are native uh, adipocytes and this lesion was essentially from the beginning infiltrating and became later on at the periphery well circumscribed. So it is very important when uh, seeing any fat component to exactly look at it if it is convincingly neoplastic or just entrapment of normal fat. The presence of a significant inflammation in the background is very useful uh, in certain differential diagnoses, and we have to be very careful. If we have a prominent inflammation as used sometimes in the oncology literature, a hot lesion, hot lesions with prominent inflammation are almost never sarcoma. They are usually either melanomas or spindle cell sarcomatoid carcinomas. If we have a biphasic lesion, this is very important. We have to think of true biphasic dif differentiation versus uh, entrapment of native epithelial cells, like in some odontogenic lesions. And of course, if the lesion is mitotically active, this is also sometimes important and very helpful in the differential. However, there is a very important uh, take home message from the beginning, uh, is, which is saying that if we have a malignant spindle cell lesion in the oral cavity or other mucosal line, head and neck sites in an older adult or elderly, starting from age 50 and 55 and above, this is almost always spindle cell sarcoma, carcinoma until proven otherwise. This is very important because if we think of this and we adhere to this concept, we are going to recognize most of cases correctly. Uh, and if we recognize sarcomatoid and spindle cell carcinomas and spindle cell melanomas correctly, then usually we got more than 90% of malignant spindle cell neoplasm in the head and neck region correctly. And the remaining is just a purpuri of different types of lesions that are sometimes very rare individually. Sarcomatoid spindle cell carcinoma, I also used to call it the great mimicker in the head and neck. In other organs, interestingly, it is not that very deceptive looking, but usually very highly pleomorphic, especially in the breast, for example, in the lung, and in some urogenital organs. However, in the oral cavity or in the mucosal line sites of the head and neck, sarcomatoid carcinoma can be deceptively 
looking, uh, we know that it shares the same, same morph demographic features as conventional and conventional head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. Most patients are middle-aged and elderly. Uh, a very characteristic feature of sarcomatoid carcinoma, which is at the same time the problem of its differential diagnosis, is that it very frequently presents as very exophytic, very polyboid, sometimes even bidonculated looking. And this is very classical pattern in the oral cavity as well as in the esophagus. And this is sometimes very deceptive if we see an unexpected histological pattern in conjunction with this exophytic, uh, purely polyboid gross pattern. Uh, it is frequently pleomorphic or so-called MFH-like morphology. However, it can be deceptively monomorphic and very fibrosarcoma-like or mesenchymal-like. Another very well-known feature of sarcomatoid head and neck squamous cell carcinoma is that it is very frequently keratin-poor or so-called keratin-shy. This means we cannot recognize any keratin expression, which is a big problem, which I will discuss later in more details. And then we have a lot of misleading patterns, including bland-looking monomorphic spindle cell, fibrosarcoma-like or leiomyosarcoma-like, etc. pattern. Uh, sometimes even we have some heterologous expression of myogenic markers in these uh, variants, which complicates the differential diagnosis. A very deceptive presentation is the granulation tissue polyblike or reactive polyblike presentation, which I have been seeing during the last few years, maybe every two to three months, I have seen such a case, which is sometimes correctly identified after three or four local recurrences. Angiomyxoid or angiomyxoma-like and angiomatous pattern as well. And we have seen cases that looks exactly like gain cell tumor of bone. And even I have seen cases being diagnosed externally at other centers as gain cell tumor of the hypopharyngeal uh, mucosa or wall. These are always sarcomatoid or undifferentiated sarcomatoid carcinomas with osteoclastic gain cells. Sometimes if they are relatively bland looking and gain cell rich, they may even look like gain cell epolis or peripheral gain cell granuloma. So we have to be very careful about that. Uh, the problem with sarcomatoid spindle cell carcinoma is, the, is that it is not always easy to prove their epithelial origin, except that they are mucosa associated. And if we look exactly, we see that the phenotype is very frequently disappointing because we cannot recognize any morphological or immunophenotypic features of differentiation. So we have to use more than one antibody types. I don't mean antibody, but antibody types, including cytokeratins, epithelial membrane antigen, and second line markers like P63, which is for itself is not specific epithelial, but in the context of an epithelial neoplasm, it is very consistent with squamous line of differentiation. So this is very important. Sometimes we have lesions that are more rich in high molecular weight cytokeratins. Some are very poor in high molecular weight cytokeratins and they express only very few low molecular weight cytokeratins like cytokeratin 18. However, in my experience, the presence of foci of carcinoma in cyto or high grade squamous intraepithelial lesion is frequently the best and the only proof of epithelial nature of the lesion which is very important to look and to search for that at the surface of the lesion. Uh, minimal foci of squamous differentiation can be seen in some lesions. And if you see them really, you do not need any immune to chemistry after that. And these foci are very frequently very close to the surface of the lesion. They are very rarely seen at the bottom or in the invasion front. Uh, we have to exclude melanoma by S100 and SOX10. And I have mentioned this 100 and SOX10 because if you have any sarcomatoid or spindle cell melanoma, then it is going to be uniformly negative for all specific melanocytic markers, including Milan A, HMB45, tyrosinase, or melanoma cocktail. All these will be negative, and you have only the possibility of S100 and SOX10. Fortunately, the vast majority of spindle cell melanomas are uniformly S100 and SOX10 positive, which you know, enable 
us to recognize them as melanomas and at the same time to exclude malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors because they are not allowed to show diffuse uh, expression of these markers if they are high grade and melanoma like. Uh, in post radiation setting, we have to consider as a differential, undifferentiated spindle cell and pleomorphic sarcoma, which is sometimes really very difficult differential. And even I, I, I know that some people do not uh, con recognize sarcoma even at these sites as true sarcomas, but as keratin shy, uh, undifferentiated or spindle cell pleomorphic carcinomas. However, in post radiation setting, I would accept the diagnosis of sarcoma, undifferentiated spindle or pleomorphic if I do not have any other specific markers, including epithelial markers and B63. Uh, B53 immunist to chemistry is very valuable in blunt looking cases because the problem in blunt looking cases is to prove their malignancy. It's very difficult sometimes, and I will show you an example of that. This is an example of a spindle cell carcinoma that is very easily recognizable as malignant. However, it is not very easy, easy to classify it as epithelial because it is relatively monomorphic, very cellular, and showing very extensive history forming and fascicular growth pattern, very similar to high-grade spindle cell sarcomas. And we see very brisk mitotic activity, more than five or six mitoses in this area. So in such a case, we have to look for S100 and SOX10 to exclude spindle cell melanoma, which is very important differential and can occasionally be monomorphic cytologically. And at the same time, we have to look for epithelial markers if we can recognize that. Uh, and it is only, however, relevant to look for epithelial markers if we do not have any foci of differentiated squamous carcinoma or in situ carcinoma. If we have that, we do not need even any immune histochemistry. This is another example. Again, you see the characteristic polypoid growth of these lesions. And unfortunately, very frequently, because of their very rapid and extensive polypoid growth, we have almost complete erosion of the surface epithelium. So it is sometimes important to make more step sections or deeper sections, the multiple levels to look for remnants of the epithelium uh, to check for dysplasia or carcinoma in situ. This case also very uniform, and it has a moderately eosinophilic or pink cytoplasm. We have to think of melanoma in such a case. At the same time, we have to think also of some pleomorphic leiomyosarcomas and immunistic chemistry is usually helpful in this context. This is one of the very deceptive uh, and misleading presentation, again, prominent polyboid growth pattern. We have extensive ulceration. However, here there is a small focus of retained mucosa with pseudo epitheliomatous hyperplasia. However, there is no dysplastic changes seen in this case. And if we look here, we see something like cellular fibrovascular stromal polyboid granulation, po the tissue polyp with prominent cellular stroma. However, we see very extensive eosinophilia. And we know that eosinophilia in a context of mucosal lesion is very, very suspicious for squamous cell carcinoma. We see it in different organs, including the uterine cervix and some head and neck sites, especially in sarcomatoid carcinoma. So prominent eosinophilia should prompt us to think of uh, the exact uh, nature of this lesion. However, assessment is mainly based on recognizing some atypical cells in the background. We have this relatively monomorphic fusiform hyperchromatic cells. And if you look exactly, we have frequently very few scattered hyperchromatic atypical looking cells with some more condensed or hyperchromatic chromatin here and there. So this is one of the possibilities being squamous cell carcinoma. Sometimes we have even angiosarcoma or some carbosiform-like pattern. However, still we have more pleomorphic atypical looking spindle cells, and we have these gabbing or capillary sized vessels sometimes lined with atypical looking cells. Most of these are pseudovascular and not true vascular spaces. However, if we look exactly, we see very frequently very 
prominent, sometimes atypical mitotic activity here. Again, a mitotic figure here may be as well. And we see that there is great variation in size and shape of the nuclei as well as in the chromatin density. This is another example showing again the extensively polypoid exophytic growth and extensive surface ulceration. Here we see still there is some leukoplakic mucosa with prominent hyperkeratosis, however, no really dysplasia seen. Then we have this fibrinous ex exudative cap at the top of the lesion. And then starting from here, we have this granulation tissue-like uh, proliferation, very interestingly, which is very frequent feature seen both in contact granulomas, for example, in the larynx and vocal cords. However, also in many sarcomatoid carcinomas, this ver vertical orientation of the vessels to the surface of the lesion. However, still there are some irregularities and transverse ordering or even irregular placed uh, vascular spaces. However, this is very characteristic feature of these lesions. It looks here really like uh, exuberant granulation tissue with prominent edematous and myxoid stroma. We have very prominent eosinophilic and neutrophilic inflammation and these communicating vessels. However, if we see the cells in between, they really look hyperchromatic, atypical with very prominent mitotic activity in many areas. This is another example showing even uh, tissue culture-like pattern, no real stroma except for mucoid and myxoid, matrix-like accumulation of this material, and then we have the vessels, we see very prominent atypical-looking mitotic activity here and there. Sometimes we have even much more cellular areas. This is an example from the larynx, and this lesion really very deceptive-looking. It looks like fibromyxoid or fibromyofibroblastic covered in this area by very normal-looking squamous mucosa, very uniform cytology indeed, and no pleomorphic nuclei. However, it has very prominent mitotic activity and was even uh, positive with uh, a smooth muscle actin, but also has more additional epithelial markers as well. However, the next point after thinking of sarcomatoid spindle cell carcinoma, we have some cases that are from the outset, malignant histologically, some look very bland. They are still similarly aggressive at their pleomorphic variants. The first question would be how to prove the epithelial origin. Many of these lesions are keratin poor or shy. You see here, cytokeratin is turning the surface epithelium. However, the lesion is completely negative. So we have to think of different uh, types of uh, features that can help us to confirm their epithelial origin. And we start as always by conventional histology, which is very quick and very cheap, of course. So if we have any foci, how, no matter how minimal of squamous differentiation, we have to be sure it is malignant cytologically, as we see here in this area. Uh, this is the best proof of a carcinoma. We see here even the spindle cell sarcomatoid. We have some abortive epithelial islands, and here it is very clearly squamous. So this is a sarcomatoid or a spindle cell squamous cell carcinoma. No need for any ancillary tools. This is the example I have shown you from the larynx, and this was very interestingly associated with the focus of carcinoma in situ with features of HBV infection showing this coelocytic epithelial changes and very prominent block type P16 expression in the carcinoma in situ like component sparing the normal mucosa or with the abrupt transition to the non-dysplastic mucosa. Unfortunately, I do not have information about the real presence of HBV in this case, but it looks very much like HBV associated sarcomatoid spindle cell carcinoma. So in such a case, again, we do not really need any immunohistochemistry to verify this component. And interestingly, this is spindle cell component showed exactly the same B16 pattern, which is very uniformly positive. However, sometimes we do not have any focus of intra-epithelial neoplasia. We do not have uh, squamous foci, and then we have to look for immunomarkers to prove the epithelial 
the line of differentiation, as I said, there is no really a well established rule which types of cytokeratins are helpful. We have a subset of cases very positive with high molecular weight cytokeratins, negative with the low molecular weight cytokeratins, and the reverse is true for other type of lesions. However, it is, has been well appreciated that if we do not have any keratin reactivity, we have always to include cytokeratin 18, which is usually is not included in the in most of the low molecular weight cytokeratin panels we use like AE13 and KL1. These do not include cytokeratin 18, so we have to include it if we don't have that. And we see here cytoplasmic expression in most of the neoblastic cells. And this is very helpful because we see that the cells that are cytokeratin positive, most of them are atypical looking in contrast to these possibly reactive myofibroblastic stromal cells in the background. So it is on the inflammatory cells, of course, as well. Uh, P63 is also helpful. However, it is context specific and can be expressed in something uh, in, 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 in other different entities as well. So we see in this case exactly similar to cytokeratin 18, the same atypical looking cells with the larger nuclei are positive with P63. In my opinion, it is an experience, it is more sensitive, although less specific than P40. P40 is frequently negative in many of these cases. This is another example showing a hypercellular spindle cell area and showing some degree of epitheliotropism approaching the surface mucosa, which is also P63 positive as internal control. This is very important. The next question after being sure this is epithelial, we do not, we, all, we are not always sure that these are carcinomas. So we have to be sure about their being malignant in nature. Sometimes this is very difficult. And one of the markers really that uh, proves in my and the experience of many other people uh, valuable in proving malignancy in these lesions is P6, P53. P53 is a tumor suppressor and usually based on the type of mutation, there may be overexpression of the protein uh, as we see here or completely absent expression. Both cases are P53 mutated. However, it is very important to recognize these two patterns because uh, this is the most easiest uh, pattern to interpret because we need this very strong and homogeneous reactivity in practically almost all of the neoblastic cells. If you look at the vascular endothelial cells, you see the classical regular or wild type pattern some nuclei are negative, others are weakly positive, others are moderate positive. So this uh, admixture of different degrees of expression, this is a physiological normal wild type expression. This is very easy to recognize. However, we have frequently problems with interpreting the nil phenotype P53 pattern. And sometimes this is complicated because we have very prominent fibroblastic cells and inflammatory cells in the background of many of the sarcomatoid spindle cell carcinomas. And we have to be very careful about that. We have to look at areas with better recognizable neoblastic cells. And if we look here in these uh, microtrabicular aggregates or here in the spindle cells, the nuclei are completely negative, even scattered cells completely negative. However, the fibroblastic stromal cells show different degree of expression the inflammatory cells as well. So this is a definitely a neoplastic. We never see something like this or like this in a benign uh, squamous cell lesion. This is almost always neoplastic or malignant. So we can use this really as surrogate for malignancy in difficult to classify deceptively bland looking spindle cell or sarcomatoid squamous cell carcinomas. I just like to share with you this example, which I have seen a few weeks ago. Uh, for second opinion, the patient is 67 year old female with a tongue mass. And it is very interesting to note that the clinician uh, submitted this excisional biopsy with the question of squamous cell carcinoma. I received the case from a colleague with the question uh, proliferative or nodular myofasciitis slash myositis of the tongue 
muscle. So we see a relatively well circumscribed but not encapsulated focally infiltrating lesion. The surface mucosa is very well preserved. Even below that, we have a small grains zone without any remarkable findings. So this is sometimes very deceptive in the tongue, especially we do not always have exactly the orientation we expect for carcinomas. And we see that it looks as if it were mesenchymal or primarily originating in the muscle. We see the residual atrophic skeletal muscle, some of them building multinucleated myogenic cells. And in between, we have this fibromyxoid spindle cell proliferation. This is very complicated case indeed, because the problem is that if we think it is malignant, then we have always the problem of overinterpreting or the risk of overinterpreting extensive bizarre looking myogenic gain cells due to the destructive growth within the muscle. So what looks like very atypical, it might be all our skeletal muscle nuclei. At the same time, we have some nuclei that look a bit atypical. We don't know uh, how this lesion differentiates. This is another area from the same lesion showing prominent uh, histiocytic gain cell reaction, sometimes with peripherally located nuclei. So it looks like maybe something inflammatory or granulomatous or due to specific infection. However, as said, we have always to think of spindle cell and sarcomatoid carcinoma in any intraoral spindle cell lesion in all the adults or the elderly. We see also here some a typical looking nuclei. Another area we see this nuclei that are more hyperchromatic, atypical looking, sometimes even like mummified and uh, enlarged. Still, really, it is very difficult to prove that this is a neoplastic spindle cell lesion of possible epithelial origin. As I have shown you, we need really the three markers an epithelial marker, P63, and P53. So if we look here, this is cytokeratin 5, highlighting this very irregular shape, uh, sometimes in the alpha, Indian file, like arranged in neoblastic cells. They are also positive with pan cytokeratin. B63 is also specifically positive only in them, and we see how much non-neoblastic fibromyxoid fasciitis like, like myofibroblastic proliferation. This is, of course, not surprising because any lesion, whatever it is, benign or malignant, mesenchymal or non-mesenchymal, if it grows into skeletal muscle, we have this type of bizarre uh, myofibroblastic reparative uh, reaction with fasciitis, fasciitis or myositis-like uh, appearance in any muscle tissue. This is, of course, P53, again, specifically highlighting these single scattered cells and some microtrabecular or strand-like arrangement. So this is indeed a case of post-cellular sarcomatoid and single cell pattern, poorly cohesive squamous cell carcinoma in the tongue. So this is very important, and the colleague was very surprised and, uh, by the diagnosis. Indeed, I was surprised, too, because at the, from the H and E, it is very bland looking. It does not look like a carcinoma. However, we know that from the main important take home message I started with any spindle cell lesion in an old adult or elderly squamous cell carcinoma until proven otherwise. This is another example which made me very crazy indeed because I, I, I thought of many possibilities. In, initially, I thought this is almost sure case of sarcomatoid spindle cell carcinoma with fibromyxoid features. It was from the alveolar rich area, came from maxillofacial surgeon. You see the mucosa is very normal. Then we have some inflammation and ulceration, and then this multinodular, discontinuously growing new plasma is uh, fibromyxoid uh, pattern. We have some uh, big lobulation or nesting, <coughs> sorry. Even we see here a small nest with some whirling of the neoplastic cells and scattered larger cells with hyperchromatic nuclei, which is very unusual indeed in this context. And otherwise, it looks relatively bland with no more than slight to moderate cytological atypia. <clears throat> then we have here, uh, again, this whirling. We have some scattered lymphocytes. Seeing something like that, we have to think, of course, of sarcomatoid carcinoma because it is the most important differential. 
And then, of course, we have to think on ways of follicular dendritic cell neoplasm because they may look very similar to this in doing uh, some whirling, some vague lobulation, some scatter lymphocytes in the background, and story form like uh, pattern or arrangement. But these markers are included and were negative CD21, CD23, and others. This is at higher magnification. Here it looks really mesenchymal. It is fibromic, so it relatively, relatively uniform cytology. And we have this very unusual trabecular or rhythmic arrangement of some sort of the nuclei, but the overall appearance is not that of a typical uh, nerve sheath neoplasm. Then we have some areas that look like perineural cells with fusiform or pointed, elongated, this slender nuclei, hyperchromatic. We have this. Uh, bipolar cytoplasm is going into the stroma. We have some inclusion in very few nuclei, so it looks really like a perineural lesion. This is immunohistochemistry with the neurogenic markers, and very interestingly, if anyone show, shows me this image and said this is an EMA from a lesion as a soft tissue pathologist, I would, I would say this is perineurioma. However, there, are pro there is a problem with this diagnosis. This is S100. And it was positive in maybe 10 to 20% of the neoplastic cells, but very variable indeed. So the question would be, is this a peripheral, a benign peripheral nerve sheath neoplasm with hybrid differentiation of schwannoma, is 100 positive, and perineurioma, EMA positive? All other markers like epithelial, melanocytic, etc., were negative. Melanoma is one of the most important considerations, of course. However, the problem is that GLUT1, and Claudine one are the most reliable perineurial cell markers. They are both negative. And we know that GLUT1 <coughs> compared to EMA and Claudine one is very strong, usually almost 100% sensitive, but less specific because it is associated with metabolic activity. And if the neoplastic cells are metabolically active, then they may express GLUT1. So it is not specific, but it is very useful to highlight perineurial differentiation in probable or in confirmed perineuriomas. However, EMA is more reliable and it can be, of course, positive in many other entities. So uh, this was one of the possibilities. However, if we look exactly, the neoplastic cells are very variable in shape and size. They are at least moderately atypical looking and we have atypical looking mitotic activity. So indeed you almost never see any prominent mitotic activity as in this case in a perineurioma. So my diagnosis indeed was low grade fibromyxoid neoplasm with perineurial like features unclassified. We have to be very restrictive in naming entities if we don't know exactly what they are. Uh, very recently, there was a nice article uh, by Jason Hornick from Boston about perineurioma with hybrid variant differentiation. Most of cases uh, showed surprisingly exactly the same translocation VGLL3. This is very interesting to, to know and to uh, uh, see that we have in some lesions that are not thought to be associated with any translocation. We recognize uh, surprisingly many translocations. But the problem is that we have here the perineurioma or the hybrid schwannoma, perineurioma like morphology. However, it looks atypical. Nevertheless, if we have any unusual looking phenotype, we have to go for translocation testing. And I sent this case uh, to our molecular lab for RNA sequencing by our NGS panel. And surprisingly, uh, an EWSR ATF1 fusion was detected. And then I said, this is very surprising. It fits well the S100 expression, at least in part, but not a specific entity. And then I looked for fish, and it was indeed confirmed that the EWSR uh, gene uh, locus is rearranged. So this is the family of EWSR ATF1 fusion and euplasm. We know that it is classically seen in clear cell sarcoma of tendons and aponeurosis, as described by Ensinger as soft tissue melanoma earlier. And these cases are uniformly positive with all melanoma markers, inclu including HMB45, Milan A, et cetera. So our case does not really fit that. Malignant gastrointestinal neuroectodermal tumor is strictly GI neoplasm. Uh, 
uh, but very re recently, one or few cases have been described, even single case in the head and neck, but they are usually, and most importantly, SOX10 positive, which is not the case in this case, and they are usually uniformly S100 positive, so this is usually excluded. Angiomatoid fibrous histiocytoma, EMA positive, but there's mean CD99 uh, positive. EMA, in this case, is very perineuroma-like, and the overall histology, of course, is not compatible with angiomatoid fibrous histiocytoma as well as the location. Clear cell carcinoma of salivary and odontogenic origin is usually uniformly cytokeratin and P63 positive, and this is definitely not a clear cell carcinoma. Other rare continuously identified entities and lesions are uh, associated with this translocation. So the case I have presented is not a sarcomatoid spindle cell carcinoma, is not a sarcomatoid melanoma, but uh, fit this rare uh, category of NOS or nosomas. And at the end, just I, I, I made a descriptive diagnosis of EWS RATF where they are range low grade fibromyxoid spindle cell neoplasm unclassified. This is very unusual case, but it is very important to show you that even at the consultation level, sometimes we have unusual looking lesions that can be missed as sarcomatoid carcinomas or similar lesions. This is another example showing lesions with prominent inflammation and sclerosis. This is a young male with vocal cord polyp, and this lesion was polypoid, covered by normal-looking mucosa. And then we see that we have normal mucosa on top of it. It is mainly by phasic composed of sclerosis with entrapment of slightly atypical spindle cell fibroblastic-like cells and very prominent inflammation, mainly uh, but angiocentric, mainly plasmacytic with some focal lymphocytic aggregates. If we see something like that, no matter how bland it looks, we have always to consider and exclude spindle cell sarcomatoid carcinoma because it is one of the lesions that really can be very sclerosing and very inflamed uh, in the background. So uh, there is no any uh, atypical marker, cytokeratin negative, B63 is negative, B53 is regular, and we see very few atypical looking fibroblastic-like cells. Some of them, of them have some dendritic-like cytoplasmic extensions. So if we have a likely benign or low-grade tumor-like lesion with prominent in areas historiform like sclerosis, prominent plasma cells, we have to think, of course, of IgG4 related disease. And this is a uh, elastic stain showing the prominent sclerosis, and this is the IgG4 showing extensive numbers of uh, plasma cells, very uh, numerous, and the IgG4 to IgG ratio was very high, more than 50%, almost all of the cells are positive for both markers. So indeed, we can start to think this is IgG-related inflammatory pseudotumor, either localized or part of a systemic disease, but we know that for any problem, sometimes there is a solution, as one said, that is fast, uh, easy, and false. And this is the alt immune to chemistry. All of the stromal cells are very strongly positive, mainly cytoplasmic, very few nuclei are stained, and even we see that the alt stain highlights this dendritic-like cytoplasmic processes, and the NGS test, I performed, confirmed the presence of ALK translocation. This is an example of inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor, the sclerosing or IgG4-like variant presenting uh, in the larynx, uh, which is uncommon but likely frequently overlooked. So this is very important. Now to, to show you a few different examples, we head and neck pathologists frequently encounter or get a specimen from something that is not really head and neck, but it does have in that the tumor originates in the head and neck. And especially the floor of the mouse or submandibular location and the soft tissue of the neck are one of the main sites of such lesions. So this is an example of very bland looking spindle cell lesion with this slender nuclei, hyperchromatic, tapered or pointed, very prominent wavy collagen fibers in the background, almost no vascular channels at all. So this really looks like something like perineurioma or 
variant of neurofibroma or even some cellular, all these scars is very complicated to come out of the diagnosis in such a case. And we have to exactly look at the lesion in different areas. However, if you are dealing with a core needle biopsy or a limited biopsy, then it is very complicated to diagnose it morphologically. This is another area showing angiofibroma of soft tissue-like pattern with prominent uh, vessels lined by activated plumb endothelial cells. We have this angiomyxoid or fibromyxoid pattern. So this area exactly recapitulates what we see in soft tissue angiofibroma, which is a very difficult diagnosis, of course, as well, however, would be benign. Another example here from the same lesion showing at the periphery, this desmoid-like uh, areas with elongated uh, fascicles of slender spindle cells in uh, this moblastic dense stroma. And we have these elongated vessels a little bit more gabbing than for desmoid. However, if we perform uh, beta-catenin, it might be, in my experience, possible to find some nuclear re reactivity. So one would make a, mis a mistake diagnosis of desmoid fibromatosis. However, if we look at the cellularity, and even the cells are relatively more primitive looking, fusiform, and smaller than the long, slender, uh, elongated myofibroblastic cells and fibroblastic cells of desmoid fibromatosis. Sometimes we have this hyaline deposit surrounding vessels here again, which is very good uh, hint in this context. So we need indeed a few immune stains. If you think of desmoid, you need uh, beta catenin. If you think of SFT, I don't think SFT can look like this from the cytology uh, view. Uh, you need a STAT-6, and of course, if we think of any perineurioma or uh, neurofibroma, you need this 100 AMA claudine. The problem is that if you think of perineurioma, uh, then you might find some claudine reactivity or EMA, which is very problematic. However, fortunately, this case indeed was easy to recognize because of the classical features you see here. Therefore, it's very important to have a very good view at the low power. If you rush to the high power, this is very risky in many uh, situations. You have to look at the low power. You, you see it is well circumscribed, it is originating from soft tissue, and we have these structures, very classical at low power. These are so-called uh, collagen giant rosettes or hyalinizing collagen giant rosettes. This is very uh, exa classical example of low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma, which is unfortunately, very variable and one of the great mimickers as well. And if we do not have these uh, collagen rosettes or pseudo rosettes, it is sometimes very difficult to diagnose or even it can be easily overlooked, which make, makes not only me, but many people, even uh, Professor Fletcher in Boston, doing MAC4 in almost any neurofibroma like S100 negative, perineurioma like Claudine 1 or EMA, not diffusely positive, and anything that look like angiofibroma, et cetera, because these lesions can be deceptively uh, similar to any other entity. However, if you are lucky to find one of these structures, diagnosis can be made by H and E, of course. This is a higher magnification showing the classical non-descriptive uh, pattern of low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma really look like just a cellular connective tissue, but the rosettes are very useful. You see this palisading of more rounded epithelioid-like cells in the, surrounding the rosettes. And uh, of course, if we look exactly at the immune, you, you only need MAC4. If you think of low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma, just to stand for MAC4, you do not need any additional markers. However, sometimes you do S100, AMA, et cetera, and after having everything negative, you come back to think of low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma. And this is very interesting to see this whirling surrounding the vessels, which is very typical uh, of low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma and does not uh, is not seen except maybe CD34 in some inflammatory fibroid polyps in the GI tract. If you look at the cells surrounding the collagen rosettes, they are very epithelioid, plumb or rounded, and have much more cytoplasm. So no great fibromyxoid sarcoma is uncommon sarcoma type that is usually uh, deeply seated and may occur in 10% of cases superficially. Children and adults are affected, but it can occur at any site 
the extremities and uh, the shoulder area are the most common site. However, this neoplasm can occur in the head and neck, including very unusual uh, mucosa associated or soft tissue sites. It is often bland looking, mint, hypo cellular, hypovascularized, and collagenized with variable myxoid areas, but any lesion can have one of the single pattern seen in these tumors. So it is very difficult to think of it always. Uh, MAC4 is the only diagnostic marker, and it is in this context of the morphology very specific. You do not need any more markers. Some uh, cases with gained collagenous rosettes uh, have been described on exactly the same entity. So low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma is often a surprise diagnosis because even on imaging, it looks like some scar tissue or very uh, airy active fibrous lesion and no one thinks it is sarcoma. However, despite this bland morphology or histology, it is aggressive neoplasm uh, with frequent local recurrences and even death of the patient in almost half of the cases uh, long term. Uh, metastasis may occur as later as 50 years and more, especially in pediatric patients, and it, they may metastasize to any size, including the soft tissue, bone, lung, and pleura. Uh, there is unfortunately no effective treatment for them. This is another entity which is mainly seen in the head and neck, and I'm going just to share with you to include or to complete the spectrum of spindle cell lesions that are mainly seen in the head and neck. This is a young uh, male, uh, with a maxillary mass that was infiltrating on imaging and several surgical biopsies have been obtained. Again, look exactly at low power. We have some fibrin and hemorrhage. We have this small round spindle cell, very cellular lesion. However, they are another component. We have not to miss it, which is very important. Then we have uniform cytology. Again, uh, I uh, emphasize at the beginning, we have to check if it's pleomorphic or monotonous. Monotonous, if it is mesenchymal, this is very likely translocation neoplasm or sarcoma. If it is pleomorphic, it is almost never translocation associated. Then we have monotonous cytology. We have very prominent hemangiobery cytoma-like pattern, which is mainly seen in two entities in soft tissue, mainly in monophasic synovial sarcomas. And in this entity, I'm going to show you. This is a higher magnification, again, the monomorphic spindle cells with the scattered, this more rounded, primitive cells, nondescript morphology. It really does not look like any specific thing. It, of course, it can be synovial sarcoma. However, we see here this very distinctive vascular spaces surrounded by the neoplastic cells. And then this is the diagnosis on H and E. Indeed, you do not need any other immune stents in such a case. You have this very small foci of well-differentiated cartilage. So if we have undifferentiated and differentiated cartilage in one lesion, we have indeed only two differential diagnoses. That is one mesenchymal chondrosarcoma and the other dedifferentiated chondrosarcoma. The only difference is in the undifferentiated looking component. If it is very bizarre looking pleomorphic MFH like then this is dedifferentiated chondrosarcoma we can look for IDH mutation, et cetera. If it is small round or spindle cell, very monomorphic, and especially with this hemangiobery cytoma-like vascular pattern, then this is con mesenchymal chondrosarcoma, and we do not need really any immune stents. However, you can use CD99. If it is negative, it is not mesenchymal chondrosarcoma. The same applies for SOX9, which is not specific, but if it is negative, I would question the diagnosis. You see here, the, the cartilage and the undifferentiated, both of them are SOX9 positive. So this is a rare aggressive, usually pediatric sarcoma with a predilection for the head and neck. Even many of the cases go to the neuropathologist because they may develop intraventricular or in the cere cerebrum or cerebellum. Their cytology is very uniform or monomorphic, spindle and focally round cell. So the differential is usually synovial sarcoma. The prominent pericytoma-like vascular pattern, again, typical and also can suggest synovial sarcoma. If we have the cartilage foresight, then diagnosis can be made by immunohistochemistry. This is the immuno I mentioned to you. And of course, Ewing sarcoma is one of the most important differentials. And the classical high one NCOA2 translocation can be verified by different types of molecular testing. 
malignant sarcomatoid neoplasm is the pattern of other type fibrosarcoma or pleomorphic sarcoma have different types of differential. These are the monomorphic variants. Mainly, we have the fibrosarcoma, which can be originating in the head and neck bones. Uh, malignant peripheral nerve schist humor as well. Lyomyosarcoma, if uniform, but usually it is pleomorphic. Spindle cell rhabdomyosarcoma is a differential diagnosis that is sometimes misleading. Monophasic synovial sarcoma and spindle cell carcinoma, the monomorphic spindle cell type, of course, rarely spindle cell angiosarcoma and solitary fibrous tumors as well. If we encounter something bizarre looking pleomorphic with the spindle and epithelioid cells, then of course we have the pleomorphic variant of sarcomatoid carcinoma and melanoma. If we exclude these two in the head and neck, usually it is a very difficult differential because these are the major representatives of pleomorphic spindle cell sarcomatoid neoplasm. Lyomai sarcoma, pleomorphic liposarcoma, etc., can be considered. I don't know if I have to stop now or you need me to continue a bit. What about time? Professor Abbas, you, yeah. have, you have about five minutes. You, okay. You have interesting okay. cases and we are very interested to see your cases. Thank okay, you. Okay, so just. Yes. So sarcoma is pattern of fibrosarcoma, usually highly cellular, herringbone, high mitotic activity, monomorphic, no bizarre cell. This is very important and usually not pink, but blue, which is a difference compared to lyomyosarcoma. This is a very uh, large series published uh, recently or at least later uh, compared to the very old series by Dr. Folm, we see that they are very uniform cytologically. And we know that 20% of cases do occur in the head and neck, in the soft tissue or in the bone. This is very important to include. And by maintaining only the phenotype of all these lesions, they do not have any specific other markers. And we know that recently, very importantly, uh, some therapeutically relevant fusions like Vera fusions and Entrec fusions have been described in many of these lesions. So it is very important to make that diagnosis and to think of any therapeutic targets, of course, in them. Uh, spindle cell synovial sarcoma, of course, is very similar. I just like to show you. This is the old immunohistochemistry we used to do CD56, BCL2, CD99. This is very fine, but they are all non-specific. The only help is that if they are negative, it is not synovial sarcoma. In the monophasic type, the problem is that frequently you really do not find any cytokeratin or very few. So in a small biopsy, you are not going to find any neoplastic cell expression. Uh, however, we have two antibodies. In my experience, TLE1 is currently, at least the antibody we can uh, buy is very bad and it is non-specific. This is the older pattern. And this is a very new antibody published also by Jason Hornick, SS18, SSX antibody, which is the replacement for TLE1. It is highly specific and highly sensitive. However, we have to give it a, a little time in the market to know if it is really a specific or not, but until now it is okay. Uh, then another important example to show you is just uh, sorry, yeah, this, this example of spindle cell lesion looks like fibrosarcoma, but was desmine positive and caldesmine, caldesmine negative. Such a lesion in the head and neck and mainly in the uh, jaw or in the bones of the maxillofacial area, we have always to think of rhabdomyosarcoma. This is my eugenine, and this is an example of spindle cell rhabdomyosarcoma that exactly looks like other type fibrosarcoma. However, if we look exactly, we may have some uh, hints of more pinkish cytoblast suggesting rhabdomyoblastic differentiation. Desmine only myosarcoma is usually either spindle cell rhabdomyosarcoma, myofibroblastic sarcoma, or rare entities. And just I like to close up with this uh, image to show you that in the spectrum of fibrosarcoma like spindle cell neoblasm, we have to think always of many other entities, including fibrosarcomatous 
dermatofibrosarcoma protuberance, we can just recognize it usually by molecular because there is no specific markers for it. Even CD34 is usually negative. And even if CD34 is negative, we have to think always of solitary fibrous tumor with high cellularity and STAT6 is indeed uh, very positive in these tumors. And uh, we can recognize this entity without any problem. I will just like to stop here because I have just a few cases of myofibroblastic lesion, but I think most of them might be even covered by the presentation of uh, Dr. Hanna. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Abbas, for your informative presentation. If you would let me, uh, I would like to share a few questions with you, and then we will go to Dr. Safar for the next presentation. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, would you let, uh, let us know about uh, the expression of myogenic uh, markers in sarcomatoid carcinoma? Um, is, is it common to, ex, uh, to, to detect expression of myoD1, myogenin, or desmin in sarcomatoid carcinoma or not? Yeah, this is a very important question. Uh, we, we know that we have, of course, the smooth muscle markers, smooth muscle actin, desmin, and caldesmone. Then we have the rhabdomyoblastic. The smooth muscle marker, the problem is with smooth muscle actin. In my experience, anything that becomes spindle can be actin positive. Otherwise, it cannot be spindle because to have a spindle cell morphology, you have to have elongated myofilaments in the cytoplasm. Otherwise, it will be not a spindle cell type. And uh, therefore, I do not like to include this most muscle actin in any sarcomatoid high-grade neoplasm. I need to see it in nodular fasciitis-like lesions because if it is negative, this will alert me to something else. Uh, however, and caldesmon is only problematic in that, I don't know in your country, but in Germany, more than 50% of the labs who send me consultation, they have the wrong caldesmon. It is always positive in nodular fasciitis and many smooth muscle lesions. We have a good one. It is not our own, but it is uh, commercially available, and it stains only through smooth muscle neoplasm. So if you include caldesmone, it is negative. Usually you exclude through smooth muscle neoplasm or leiomyosarcoma, of course. Desmin associated usually with myogenin or myoD1 is almost seen only in those lesions with true rhabdomyoblastic differentiation. Mm -hmm. So if the sarcomatoid carcinoma tends to be myogenic, then it will be rhabdomyogenic, but almost never lyomyogenic. So you need desmin and myogenin. And both of them will show you, yes, this is uh, heterologous rhabdomyoblastic differentiation. It is not really now of proven uh, prognostic or therapeutic value, but I feel it is important to recognize and mention in the report because in the metastasis, someone is going then to diagnose pleomorphic rhabdomyosarcoma. If you tell him the diagnosis initially was sarcomatoid carcinoma in the larynx, but now there is a soft tissue metastasis or cervical soft tissue metastasis, and it looks like pleomorphic rhabdomyosarcoma, you have to recognize that. But otherwise, uh, Desmin and caldesmon are sufficient to recognize myogenic features. Okay, great. And another question about uh, epithelial markers in uh, sarcomatoid carcinoma. Is one uh, epithelial markers, for example, IE1, IE3, or P63, enough to confirm sarcomatoid carcinoma, or you recommend to use more than one epithelial markers to confirm a sarcomatoid carcinoma? Okay, so uh, as I have illustrated in some slides, if I, have, I am lucky enough to have foci of intraepithelial neoplasia or squamous foci within the neoplasm, then I do not need any immune uh, confirmation. However, if I do not have any evidence of epithelial differentiation, from my feeling and experience, I know this is malignant sarcomatoid neoplasm. It should be sarcomatoid carcinoma. Then I start usually with 
pan keratine for example ae13 plus high molecular weight cytokeratin cocktail plus p63 i always request the three if all three are negative and i'm sure it is not a melanoma then usually i add more markers i add cytokeratin 18 sometimes oscar cocktail or some additional epithelial markers because sometimes really difficult to say this is carcinoma without any phenotypic or immune features of epithelial differentiation. Still, at the end, I made a diagnosis of completely epithelial negative sarcomatoid carcinoma on occasions. So I will not say this is sarcoma. Okay, great. Thank you. And the last question in this part, do you commonly use biomentin biomarker in your lab or it is not commonly used to detect uh, mesenchymal uh, tumors with mesenchymal origin? Uh, I think biomentin usually generally should not be used because anything that is sarcomatoid is biomentin positive, even if it is lymphoma, anaplastic, etc. And the sarcomatoid carcinomas, all of them are biomentin positive. I use biomentin in very few occasions. One of them, if the immuno is non-reacting, and I like to be sure this tissue is still immunogenic, then I can use bimentin to see it is very nicely positive in every cell in the background and in the spindle neoplastic cell. Then I am sure, okay, with this bimentin, <coughs> with my own slight controls, this is really negative and not false negative. Because sometimes we have some odd fixation or temperature effect, etc. that everything is negative. Even you have the internal control, but it does not mean that uh, the tissue has function. Uh, then I use my mentin really only in cases like if I am thinking in some monomorphic spindle cell lesions, if it is myoepithelial or not, then my mentin is typically expressed in most of myoepithelial lesions, yes. and of course in carcinomas, in like secretory and uh, uh, intercalated duct type and so on. Okay, thank you very much. I, I do appreciate your great presentation and please stay with us. Let's go to the next speaker, Dr. Safar. Thank you very much, Dr. Hana Safar, uh, for accepting our invitation uh, Dr. Safar is assistant professor of um, the pathology department of Cancer Institute Hospital. Um, and also she's well experienced in head and neck uh, lesions, especially soft tissue tumors. Uh, Dr. Safar, we are all ears uh, to hear your presentation. Doctor, uh, yes, great. Hello, everybody. May, thank you may, for your invitation. Uh, and uh, I wa also want to uh, thank Professor Ajami for his great presentation. It was very informative and uh, very detailed. Um, actually, we have these problems in our routine final scenario and uh, lots of the time uh, we have problem to call uh, a lesion, um, spindle cell uh, lesion. Uh, sarcomatoid carcinoma or uh, uh, sarcoma um, or like rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma because we see expression of this mean myogenin and myodivan and the patient is um, sometimes uh, in my cases usually for example she I, last week I had a case she was a um, 20, uh, 24 uh, year old one pregnant woman with alveolar ridge mass. Um, we had expression of cytokeratin A1A3, but at the same time, we had a, a strong uh, expression of this mean myogenin and myodivan. So it, it's really difficult for me to call it either sarcomatoid carcinoma or a, um, spindle cell rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. Uh, what should we do, dear professor, in these circumstances? When the patient is during his third or the fourth decade of life. How old is the patient? 24. 24, 24. A pregnant woman. She was a 24 uh, pregnant woman. Uh, and how big is the lesion? 
the lesion is big. The lesion is located in um, alveolar ridge and uh, the destruction of the uh, surrounding bone. And um, the radiolo our radiologist said that it seems that the location of the lesion is somehow um, through the mandible. And he said that uh, in radiology uh, findings, we are more uh, suggestive of sarcoma rather than carcinoma. But cytocratin A1, A3 was strongly positive. And at the same time, this mean myogeny, not myogeny uh, my one, they're all strongly positive. Myogeny is not strong, very difficult. One and this mean is strong, yeah. they're strongly positive. Of course, usually it is very difficult to give any statement from a single uh, image. Uh, but when I look just at the histology without any other uh, considerations, this is a fibromyxoid spindle cell lesion that primarily is not the classical spindle cell carcinoma and even not rhabdomyosarcoma. Not rhabdomyosarcoma. So you do agree not, does not fit any of both. Mm -hmm. It is very fibromyxoid. We have this vascular pattern, and uh, uh, we, we need to see other areas, of course, and the immune stains as well to, to assess them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very informed. Uh, so, dear Dr. Shaki, this is not my first slide. Um, Please go back to the, I think you can, can you, okay, let me join you. Maybe press the mouse and then try to click on. Thank you. Uh, so I think it's better to start. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a group of spindle cell, cell lesions of the head and neck, uh, particularly after a permission from dear Professor Ajami, uh, Dr. Shakib and I decided to present a few cases and um, uh, more focus on differential diagnosis. We selected uh, fibroblastic, myofibroblastic group because um, usually these lesions uh, don't have specific uh, IC markers and sometimes even uh, we have difficulty in, in differentiating between uh, benign, borderline, and malignant lesions in this category. So I'm going to start. As um, uh, Professor Ajami uh, mentioned, we uh, should uh, consider some uh, aspects in evaluation of every spindle cell lesion. Um, we should uh, take a precise clinical history. Patient's age is very important. Growth rate of the lesion is very important. Exact anatom anatomical lo location is, again, a very uh, helpful uh, issue. For example, some uh, lesions are located in uh, deep uh, parts and some uh, lesions are located superficially, so this is very uh, informative. A cross finding is again uh, very uh, helpful. For example, is uh, the lesion completely or frankly infiltrative, or the lesion has uh, limited borders or is encapsulated or uh, well demarcated? After that, we go to uh, microscopic uh, examination. We should evaluate cell morphology, arrangement of cells, the quality of background, is it fibrotic, mixoid, fibromyxoid, sclerotic, or control mixoid, for example. And we should also evaluate vascular meshwork. Is this, for example, artiform vascular channels or homogeneous cytoma like vascular channels or the encounter arising type vascular channels? So, it's very important to uh, consider some key points uh, to approach to a spindle cell lesion. Our first case is a 27-year-old man with subcutaneous soft tissue mass on cheek. Uh, okay, as you can see here in this picture, 
here is the skeletal, here we have skeletal muscles and here is the lesion. And the lesion is um, rather well circumscribed, it's not um, frankly invasive into the adjacent skeletal muscles. And the lesion is composed of spindle cells. It's, uh, they are arranged in fascicles in rather a mixoid background here. And when we go to the next image, we see that spindle cells are arranged somehow irregularly. It's not rather regular uh, arrangement of spindle cells. And sometimes you can find some structures. They are like in C shapes, or even here we can see S shapes structures here. Arrangement of spindle cells has created some uh, features. And in the center of the lesion, we have um, a bit mixed changes. In this picture, which is obtained from the center of the lesion, we see some fibrohyalinous material in the background. Again, spindle cell lesions are present everywhere. Here in the picture, we see more mixoid changes and then uh, again, arrangement of spindle cells somehow creating C-shaped features. Uh, and this picture from high power, we can appreciate infiltration of few inflammatory cells as well as RB6 robots. We have all RB6 vasation between spindle cells. And in this picture, we can um, see that spindle cells uh, have somehow um, tapered, uh, tapering nuclei, small amount of acidophilic cytoplasm, and they are elongated spindle cells. Again, here, foci of RBC extravasation uh, are present. And uh, on IHC study, the um, immunohistomarker uh, smooth muscle actin was positive in uh, infiltrating cells. So I think uh, one of the best uh, diagnoses that comes to the mind is nodular fasciitis. Um, actually, I selected this case because um, even though um, we know that um, we, this is a common um, soft tissue lesion and we try to consider it in our differential diagnosis, still um, nodular fasciitis remains among the um, most misdiagnosed benign uh, neoplastic lesion, which is mis among the uh, benign spindle cell lesion, which is mostly diagnosed, mis actually misdiagnosed as uh, malignancy. So uh, I think it's, uh, of, it's always um, good to think about it and to, and to consider it in uh, your differential diagnosis. Uh, but when we uh, want to diagnose a natural fasciitis, so we should uh, consider several points. For example, um, regarding clinical history, these patients are usually young patients, and uh, the history they have a history of a rapid growth of the lesion. This is very important, and uh, the size of the lesion is again very very helpful. For example, we know that um, most of the nodular fasciitis are about two centimeters in the greatest dimension. And they are almost always less than five centimeters in the aggressive dimension. So for large lesions, it's very uh, dangerous to make the diagnosis of um, nodular fasciitis, particularly in small biopsy. So we should be careful in this circumstance. And again, uh, we should um, know that the duration between existence of the lesion and operation is very important. For example, for uh, some lesions that we have short duration uh, from existence of the lesion to the uh, operation time, the lesions are more cellular. And when the, um, there is long, uh, this, uh, for example, um, time between existence of the lesion and the operation time, the background may be more sclerotic. So uh, the duration uh, had some effect on the uh, quality of the microscopic findings. So again, we should pay attention to this. But on microscopic examination, we usually have short irregular uh, bundles and fascicles. 
And we may sometimes encounter infiltration of some inflammatory cells, particularly lymphocytes and sometimes macrophages. And, and uh, extravasation of RBCs are usually present, a very useful characteristic finding for nodular fasciitis. Uh, and uh, we should know that these days, after um, we know that the um, exact nature of nodular fasciitis was a matter of debate for a long time. But these days, after uh, showing that these lesions in more than 90% have a characteristic USP6 rearrangement, it's highly believed that they are no classic in nature rather than proliferative lesions. Uh, but when we want to diagnose a lesion as nodular fasciitis, we should consider other lesions that can mimic rather similar histomorphology. For example, sometimes benign fibrocystocytomas can mimic the appearance of nodular fasciitis. But it's better to consider that nodular fasciitis, most of the times, they typically arise uh, from fascia. But benign fibrocystocytomas are typically there by this. I'm going to show you in the, picture, in the next pictures. Nodular fasciitis are somehow well circumscribed. They are not that much infiltrated. The benign fibrocystocytomas are less well circumscribed compared to nodular fasciitis. And as I showed you in the picture, in nodular fasciitis, uh, fascicles are irregularly arranged, but in uh, benign fibrocystocytomas, cells are arranged more regularly, creating a storyform pattern, crisscross pattern, and then uh, I'm going to, uh, of course, show you in the picture. Vasculature is less orderly in nodular fasciitis, whereas vasculature is orderly most of the time in benign fibrocystocytoma. And there are other histologic findings that can be helpful. For example, in benign fibrocystocytoma, they usually have sidrophages, sometimes cotton like drained cells, they are very helpful, and chronic inflammatory cells, foamy macrophages. But in nodular fasciitis, we usually encounter small amount of scattered inflammatory cells. They are not that much of them. And uh, another morphologic feature that can be very, very helpful is that in benign fibrocystocytoma, we can find peripherally located dense collagen bundles entrapped by uh, spindle cells. And this is again very helpful finding. Sometimes in cellular phase of nodular fasciitis, it's very difficult to distinguish it from benign fibrocystocytoma. But fortunately, this diagnosis, um, it does not have a, a very um, adverse effect on patients. So just it's better to mention that they can follow the patient and, and there is no um, suspicious for malignancy and just um, we are not able at this stage to dismiss the differentiate between nodular fasciitis or cellular phase of nodular fasciitis or a benign fibrocystocytoma. Sometimes it may happen. As you can see in this picture, here is a benign fibrocystocytoma. Uh, in comparison with nodular fasciitis, we see that this is completely dermal based, but nodular fasciitis in its typical presentation, it comes from subcutis, it originates from fascia, and it uh, arises from the fascia upward. Uh, at the periphery of, uh, periphery of benign fibrocystocytoma, as I showed you, um, it's entrapment of collagen bundles. This finding is very characteristic for, nodular, for a benign fibrocystocytoma, and we never see this feature in nodular fasciitis. In contrast, in nodular fasciitis, then we have hyalinized collagen, uh, uh, for example, bundles or material, they are uh, more commonly seen in the center of the uh, lesion, not in periphery and in interface borders. Another feature that can help us is uh, in benign fibrocystocytomas, we usually see uh, hyperplasia of surface epithelium. This is again very helpful, but we don't see this finding in nodular fasciitis. 
Here we have a lead filtration of spindle cells. As you can see here, they are arranged more regularly compared to nodular pasteurysis. And we have here um, multinucleated totontized giant cells. And these uh, giant cells, if we are lucky and we can find, we find them, then we will be enough confident to cause a lesion uh, and benign fibrosis to cytoma. The arrangement is more regular, as you can see here. And areas of interstitial and pericellular and uh, vascular hyalinization uh, can be seen in uh, benign fibrosis to cytoma. So uh, the uh, combination of these features, we can differentiate nodular fasciitis from a benign fibrosis to cytoma. Again, um, presence of um, foamy macrophages uh, is very important. We usually see them in benign fibrosis cytomas. And actually, benign fibrosis cytomas has, um, cytoma have, um, benign fibrosis cytomas have a combination of spindle cells, even sometimes round cells with um, Xanthomatous cells, siderophages, chronic inflammatory cells, maybe uh, totem type giant cells. So uh, they are um, they, uh, uh, more, cell, more kind of cells we can encounter compared to nodular fasciitis. And another finding uh, which is very, very helpful and important is that uh, in benign fibrous histiocytomas, uh, at the interface between subcutaneous fat, we usually have uh, infiltration of small mature lymphocytes, aggregation of small mature lymphocytes in the interface between the uh, lesion and the uh, subcutaneous fat. And this is in contrast to typical honeycomb infiltration of subcutaneous fat, which we can see in DFSP. So this finding again uh, could be very helpful uh, to, uh, for the diagnosis of benign fibrosis to cytoma. Another lesion that uh, can um, lie in differential diagnosis with nodular fasciitis is a, a myofibroma. Myofibroma, again, is a soft tissue lesion. In uh, WHO classification, myofibroma is um, located beside myofibroma in um, tumors of uh, precytic origin, but actually um, some studies, uh, particularly one famous study by Professor Ajani showed that sometimes molecular features is not similar in myofibromas and uh, myofibromas. I'm going to show you the um, prestigious article in the next slide. Uh, so we know that nodular fasciitis is extremely rare in newborns and infants. Whereas uh, one of the peak um, age um, of uh, myofibromas is um, newborns and infants. So uh, whenever we encounter a spindle cell lesion in newborns and infants, it's better to think of a myofibroma. These lesions can be either solitary or multiple. Then they are multiple, they are called myofibromatous. They are nodular. They can be everywhere, anywhere. For example, they can be in oral mucosa, head and neck, skull. So uh, they can be superficially located. They can be sometimes deep located. So we just have to think about it and consider it in our differential diagnosis. Uh, in a typical uh, presentation, uh, actually microscopic presentation, my fibromas are composed of uh, two components. They are biphasic. They show biphasic growth pattern. The center of the lesion, which is called dark zone, is composed of immature proliferation of immature spindle cells, creating somehow hemorrhagically cytomal-like growth pattern. And at the periphery of the lesion, we see nodules composed of fascicles of um, myoid-like cells or chondroid-like cells. And sometimes in the center, we can encounter uh, foci of calcifications or necrosis. In contrast, in nodular fasciitis, um, we sometimes have mixed changes, but we don't have biphasic growth pattern. 
in larger fasciitis, uh, we have scattered inflammatory cells and RBC extravasation, but this is not a usual finding in my fibromas. And nodular fasciitis doesn't have typical hemangiocytoma like growth pattern, which typically we can see in a light zone of my fibroma. Here you can see my, my fibroma here at the right side. We can see uh, infiltration of myoid type cells. And here in uh, the left side, proliferation of single cell system. So here is the dark zone and here is the light zone. And here infiltration of single cell, they are not regular, there is no regularizement. And if we have this lesion, particularly in a small biopsies, it's extremely difficult to classify the lesion. So in these circumstances, we have to consider all aspects together. Again, here, here is the dark zone and here is the light zone. There again, here we have, we can find myoid cells. We should remember that um, seeing this myoid component is the most helpful feature in diagnosis of myofibroma. trauma. So um, when we don't have these features and just we have uh, biopsies from the central zone, it's very difficult uh, to differ differentiate this lesion from other natures. Uh, when we have biopsies from the center and we have, um, for example, hemangiocytoma like growth pattern of a single cell, then we should consider all uh, other lesions with hemangiocytoma like growth pattern. They can be either uh, benign or they can be malignant. So uh, sometimes we need uh, IC markers, a panel of IC markers to differentiate between these lesions. And sometimes, um, Single cells are arranged in uh, more um, long fascicles, and it's difficult to differentiate it in an infant, for example, from an infantile fibrosarcoma. And then again, in small biopsies, it would be very challenging because, as I said, in my fibromas, sometimes we can see areas of necrosis and variable mitotic figures. We can find variable mitotic figures. So in these circumstances, again, it can be very difficult and sometimes it's uh, needed to check, uh, for example, do molecular study for fish in order to check um, ETB6 MTRK3 um, fusion for diagnosis of uh, infantile fibrosarcoma. So it can be extremely difficult to differentiate in small biopsies sometimes. And this is the article uh, from uh, Professor Ajami. Uh, actually, we are so lucky to uh, have him to, uh, today with us. It's a very informative uh, uh, article regarding uh, mutations in PDGFRB gene uh, in uh, myofibromas, either uh, familiar or sporadic, and uh, how to differentiate them from uh, myofibromas. Um, it's an article from uh, in, it's published in 2017 in uh, American Journal of Surgical Pathology. And um, if you are interested, you can study it. Uh, so these lesions were benign. For example, benign fibrocystocytoma and uh, myofibromas are among the benign lesions. But sometimes it's difficult to differentiate natural fasciitis from a sarcoma, for example, a myofibroblastic sarcoma, which tends to be most of the time a low-grade sarcoma. So it can mimic somehow histomorphologic features. So what should we do in these uh, circumstances? As I showed, um, I, I, as we discussed, uh, natural, in natural fasciitis, this clinical story is very important. Age of the patient is very important. Uh, in natural fasciitis, the lesion, um, appears suddenly and grows rapidly. And uh, we said that most of the time, the size is small. We should be very, very cautious when we want to um, call a large lesion nodular fasciitis. We should be completely uh, certain to call it nodular fasciitis. So be very careful in large lesions. And as we said, a nodular fasciitis um, they, um, the cells are usually uh, uniform and we don't see areas of nuclear hypochlonasia, but in myofibroblastic sarcomas, 
uh, by definition, they should have areas of uh, hyperchromasia and areas of areas of at least moderate degree of nuclear ATP. Clinical borders are frankly invasive. My fibroblastic sarcomas tend to invade adjacent tissue in a very um, wide pattern, but this is in contrast to um, Versi comes rather like uh, at least Versi comes far marginal nodular fascia. Um, sometimes in my fibroblastic sarcomas, we have fascicles uh, of a long fascicles of a single cell with, uh, with creation of pairing form pattern, sometimes story form pattern. Uh, but as uh, I said, for most of the time, we should search for areas of hyperchromasia and nuclear ATP. In small biopsies, it may be very challenging. And maybe we, uh, we cannot diagnose the lesion at all, but uh, we in vertical surgeries, we have to search and submit uh, representative uh, sections in order to find areas of hyperchromasia. And um, IC markers are unfortunately, um, are not that much helpful to distinguish, uh, for distinguishing between these kinds of lesions. But it said that in my fibroblastic sarcomas, sometimes the SMA is positive, sometimes the skin is positive, but um, they are usually uh, diffusely positive for calconic. And this can be very helpful, particularly when we want to differentiate this from limer sarcomas. Sometimes uh, my fibroblastic sarcomas are in differential with limer sarcomas. And in Lyme sarcoma, we expect expression of SMA, the skin, and H. caldesmon. But in my fibroblastic sarcoma, H. caldesmon is usually negative, and diffuse expression of uh, calconin would be helpful. Uh, my fibroblastic sarcoma is usually low grade, although sometimes it can be uh, high grade, and areas of the differentiation are reported. But they are usually low grade. They often recur locally, and they uh, do not tend to mix up. To have distant metals. Here we can see areas of uh, spindle cell proliferation, spindle cell arrangement of cells in uh, myofibroblastic sarcoma. You can find multiple figures. Area at least uh, low to intermediate degree of nuclear ATP is seen. And here the lesion is more uh, cellular arrangement of cells. Is, the cells are arranging long fascicles, intersecting fascicles, somehow creating herringbone pattern. And this is um, not usually seen in nodular fascia. It's very cellular and somehow uh, it's, we should be very careful in these circumstances. We should not call it uh, very easily a benign or proliferative lesion. Okay, next case. Next case is a, a 40 year old man with parotid mass and a diagnosis of lomorphic adenoma on uh, aspiration, pineal aspiration. Again, uh, you can he, uh, see here um, residue of salivary gland. And here we have the lesion. It seems that the lesion is rather well circumscribed. It's not infiltrated. Um, we don't see infiltrated borders at all. It's composed of spindle cells. Let's move to the next picture. Uh, as you can see here, spindle cells are arranged in somehow haphazard pattern. It's not very regular pattern again. And sometimes they have a collagenous material in background. This is a um, blood vessels, uh, hyalinized blood vessels. The wall of the vessel is somehow hyalinized. And here in this picture, we can see a nice uh, are rising hemangiopericytoma like stacked horn uh, vascular channels and again presence of sclerotic material, fibrosclerotic material in uh, admixed with these spindle cells. And uh, we can somehow appreciate that uh, these vascular channels are somehow slit like and they are compressed by uh, spindle cells. 
Again, the hypothesis the arrangement of spindle cells and alternate uh, alteration areas of fibrosclerotic changes. Here, this stroma is some so somehow mixed with changes for colic, and again, prevascular hairization is seen. In high power, this um, sac horn um, arborizing vascular channel is uh, better seen. And um, this is the P63. Um, here are uh, entrapped um, salivary gland, normal salivary glands. And um, because I think that in salivary glands, uh, spindle, when we are discussing salivary glands, spindle cell lesions, uh, we should uh, consider, I think, myoepithelial lesions in our differential diagnosis. So um, I um, um, put uh, P63 beside uh, general cytokratin markers, cytokratin A1, A3, in order to see that um, if these cells, uh, spindle cells are positive. Um, I think they were, um, I did not expect that they show uh, you know, reaction for P63, but I uh, just think that whenever we want to diagnose a very rare lesion in some ways better to first exclude the more common lesions of that location. These cells show the strong immune reaction for CD34, and at the same time, they were strongly positive for BCL2. Uh, I actually, or unfortunately, we don't have such six HC marker in our center, which would be extremely uh, helpful for diagnosis of cytoid fibrous tumor. Uh, I think one of the best uh, diagnosis for this case is cytoid fibrous tumor. We should consider cytoid fibrous tumor in our um, differential diagnosis because it can occur everywhere. For example, in superficial locations, in deep locations, in uh, somatic soft tissues, in within visceral organs. So it can uh, be everywhere. In uh, up to 15% of cases can be seen in head and neck region. Sinonasal tract and orbit are uh, more common locations for cytoid fibrous tumor compared to salivary glands. And in uh, cytoid fibrous tumor, uh, usually cell spindle cells are arranged irregularly and composite. Stroma can be a bit collagenous in some regions, uh, and sometimes you can show mixed state changes. And the characteristic hemangiopericytoma like um, appearance uh, is conspicuous. But in differential diagnosis, again, sometimes we should consider fibrous histiocytoma, either benign fibrous histiocytoma or deep fibrous histiocytoma. But as we said, um, characteristic hemangiopericytoma like those pattern, which we can see in cytoid fibrous tumor, usually is not seen in fibrous histiocytoma. Pyramidized stack horn vascular channels are uh, absent in uh, fibrous histiocytoma. And the mixture of cells and uh, in the fibrous histiocytoma, as we discussed, we usually have uh, some inflammatory cells, some joint cells, or zontomatous elements beside spindle cells. But sometimes, in, for example, orbital region or sinonasal tract, it's extremely difficult to differentiate between a deep fibrous histiocytoma, which can show the immune reaction for CD34 and cytotoxic fibrous tumors. And in these circumstances, that six IUC marker would be very helpful. Uh, so um, it's very good to have this marker in your laboratory, and we can use it in challenging cases. And other lesions that are in differential diagnosis with uh, cytotoxic fibrous tumor can be the benign or malignant. Uh, and um, fortunately, most of the malignancies, for example, synovial sarcoma or mesenchymal chondrosarcoma that Professor um, showed one of the interesting cases, um, they usually um, have IC markers. And, most of the time, we are able to, uh, for example, differentiate synovial sarcoma from a solitary fibrous tumor. As we know, uh, CD34 expression is extremely rare in synovial sarcomas. 
and um, fat sticks again would be very very helpful and for mesenchymal control sarcoma in small biopsies it can be very difficult if we are so if we have um, a vertical space vertical surgery specimens and we can find um, cartilaginous component then uh, it will be uh, easier for us but, but in small biopsies particularly flammable angiopathy sarcoma like areas it can be very challenging and again we should consider age of the patient exact anatomical location because mesenchymal chondrosarcomas can rarely occur in soft tissue uh, as well and they are not always in uh, bone lesion rare example of uh, soft tissue involvement by mesenchymal chondrosarcoma is also um, reported so i think mesenchymal chondrosarcoma is among the lesions that we should remember that we have to think about it otherwise it can be easily missed i think some lesions are in pathology that we just have to think about them and consider them in our differential diagnosis. And this is, uh, at least in this stage, I think this is again very important to consider. And this is the um, original article um, which was presented by uh, Professor Hornick and Professor Fletcher. And they um, showed that expression of SAT6 is very extremely useful for uh, diagnosis of solitary fibrous tumor. Again, a very uh, prestigious article for those who are interested in. And nowadays, we know that for solitary fibromas, we have to um, do risk stratification. Like, for, for example, gastrointestinal stroma tumor G, we have to uh, mention risk stratification in our pathology report. Age of the patient, size of the tumor, and number of microfit figures, presence or absence of necrosis are very important. And based on uh, this risk stratification, the lesion uh, can be a low grade, a low risk, a low risk, moderate case, or high risk. And in some uh, RCTs and in, uh, in new edition of WHO classification of soft tissue and bone, we uh, now see that sometimes solitary fibrous tumors can show areas of de differentiation. And this is again important. If you see areas of de differentiation, for example, tumor like undifferentiated colomorphic sarcoma, these side areas of typical solitary fibrous tumor. Think of the differentiation in solitary fibrous tumor. So again, we should be representative. We should uh, provide enough samples from all uh, portions of our specimen in order to um, classify the lesion definitely, and we can uh, reach to the correct um, histologic um, grade and um, level of risk. Case three. A four-year-old girl with submental mass. Uh, again, a residue of normal cerebral glands are present here. The lesion here is uh, somehow well circumscribed. And uh, we see uh, infiltration of finger cells which are arranged in long fascicles here. Again, long fascicles with uh, finger cells with tapering nuclei. And um, area thin ball vascular channels with uh, clear zones of uh, halo, create halo around the thin ball uh, vascular channels. Spindle cells are arranged in somehow sweeping way. They are very long fascicles. Again, create vascular halo. And here we see that adjacent skeletal muscles are infiltrated by neoplastic cells. So the lesion is not, uh, we can not call the lesion a well circumscribed lesion anymore. Again, infiltration of skeletal muscles while uh, infiltrating cells. Here, infiltration of skeletal muscles from a uh, high power. And I think again, by on to this diagnosis is this my type fibromatoid. This my type fibromatoid is, is a locally adverse mutation. They are borderline lesions. When we uh, um, um, discuss borderline lesions, these lesions can be either um, locally aggressive or rarely metastasizing. 
However, this type of fibromatosis is among low high at risk region. A gain up to 50% of cases can occur in hair and nail region. And microscopically, um, single cells are arranged in long fascicles. Sometimes they can find uh, pin ball vascular channels that are emphasized on the pictures. They are very uh, characteristic with their clear halo zone, particularly in small needle biopsies. This feature can be very helpful. And uh, in uh, this type of fibromatosis, we usually don't see areas of hyperchromasia, and mitotic figures are rarely found. And uh, if we have a nuclear uh, beta catenin expression, which is usually seen in up to 75% of the cases, then uh, it will be very helpful for, uh, diagn for our diagnosis. But again, we should consider other lesions are now differential diagnosis. One of the most important ones is desmoplastic fibroma, because both of these lesions can occur in young adults and um, and children. So it's very important to know uh, the exact location of the lesion. Dysmoplastic fibroma is histomorphologically rather indistinguishable from dysmoidal fibromatosis, but it's located in bone. There is, uh, it's not always easy to differentiate between these lesions. And uh, for a radiologist, again, it's not uh, usually possible. Sometimes we have fibromatosis that has eroded, uh, eroded bone. And sometimes we have dysmoplastic fibromas with uh, some parts of soft tissue components that is not exactly uh, possible to say that the lesion, the main of uh, bulk of the lesion is located in uh, either bone or in the soft tissue. So sometimes it can be very challenging for a radiologist. But microscopically, again, we have infiltration of single cells, bland-looking single cells in lung fascicles. And nuclear expression of beta catenin can be seen in desmoplastic fibroma, but it is not as common as um, for uh, desmoid-type fibromatosis. Another lesion in differential diagnosis is, again, my fibroma particularly when we have a small biopsy. I think sometimes it, um, maybe it's not um, usually, it's not completely uh, possible for us uh, to distinguish between them. But useful uh, features can be these features that I'm going to tell you. For example, in fibromatosis, we have more cellular, uniform cellular pattern. And in my fibroma, we should at least try to find biphasic pattern, areas of dark zone and areas of light zone. In fibromatosis, we don't have areas of necrosis or hemangiopericytoma light force pattern. Mitotic figures are rarely seen in fibromatosis, but in my fibroma, uh, variable amount of mitotic figures can be found. Sometimes areas of necrosis are present in my fibroma, whereas these features are not features of this my type fibromatosis. Nuclear staining for beta catenin can be again helpful if we can see it is more in favor of fibromatosis compared to my fibroma. Again, sometimes we should have to differentiate fibromatosis um, from my fibroblastic sarcoma. In small biopsies, again, it can be challenging. But in fibromatosis, most uh, uniform cellular pattern is expected, whereas in my fibroblastic sarcoma, as we discussed, at least areas of moderate hypochromasia and nuclear ATPRC. And the uh, IC marker calponi can be helpful in these circumstances. Uh, strong immunoreaction for calponin is in favor of my fibroblastic sarcoma, but uh, we do not expect it in fibromatosis. But do remember, please, that sometimes um, beta catenin nuclear expression can be seen in my fibroblastic sarcoma. So again, we should consider all features together to come to the uh, definite diagnosis, I think. Okay, uh, I think um, this, was, uh, this is the, my last slide of presentation, and I think it's 
better to uh, consider that uh, in every spindle cell lesion of the head and neck, particularly in fibroblastic, my fibroblastic neoplasm, uh, at least uh, it's, um, very, it's very important for us to classify the lesion uh, as benign or their proliferative, borderline or malignant. At least it's better to um, uh, tell the clinician, in, particularly in a small biopsies, that we are considering clinical data, radiologic findings, and uh, microscopic evaluation and ancillary studies. We are in favor of a borderline lesion or a malignant lesion, for example, a sarcoma. Uh, we should consider that small biopsies may not be representative of whole lesion. And sometimes it's important to mention it as a comment or a note in order to tell the clinicians that in, in small biopsy, we have some limitations for a definite classification of our lesion. Uh, if there is uh, any question, I would be happy. And um, you can also send your questions to my email. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Safar, for your nice informative presentation. Uh, I know that you have several cases uh, in month in your center, but because of time shortage, uh, you, you couldn't present all of these cases. And thank you for sharing these cases with us. Uh, if you would let me, uh, I will share few questions with uh, both of you professors and uh, we have to get finished uh, the panel at this time. Uh, Dr. Safar, we have a question. Is uh, KI-67 helpful to differentiate uh, nodular fasciitis from um, a true sarcoma or not? Uh, actually, uh, I think because uh, in nodular fasciitis, uh, nodular fasciitis, uh, um, we said that it uh, suddenly uh, occurs and uh, it has a um, rapid growth rate. So maybe uh, we can have a, a bit high proliferative activity and uh, mitotic figures. So um, for differentiating um, nodular fasciitis from a low grade sarcoma, K67 alone. Uh, it's not that much helpful, I think. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, the, the, the Professor Abbas, uh, would you let, uh, let us know your idea about how we can differentiate myofibroma from fibromatosis? You know, there is a great challenge to differentiate these um, tumors from each other. Um, could you help us how we can differentiate these tumors? Uh, you mean myofibroma versus my, my versus fibromatosis? Yes. Yeah, I, I think uh, Dr. Han has pointed that uh, out so nicely out. Uh, myofibroma had the classical zonation of uh, myoid pink staining cells alternating with dark staining, less differentiated cells. And uh, we have the hemangiovericytoma-like uh, pattern. We have, of course, the classical presentation usually in children, frequently in the head and neck, mm -hmm. uh, and usually solitary, but can be, of course, uh, multifocal. And in fibromatosis, indeed, this is it's usually deep located, and we have these elongated fascicles of very long, uniform fibroblastic cells in a dysmoblastic background, the stroma in Fibromatosis is usually either homogeneously dysmoblastic or collagenized, or maybe focally keloid like with very mm -hmm. coarse uh, collagen fibers. Uh, otherwise, association with the fascia and with the skeletal muscle, the presence of myogenic gene cells in the periphery and the vessels that are usually also in the same direction as the fascicles. The vessels are elongated and compressed. These are not seen in my in myofibromas. Okay, do, do you do you recommend to use uh, immunohistochemical staining to differentiate these two lesions or not? I I, I think it uh, th there is no reliable immunohistochemistry uh, to exactly subtype, but we use immunohistochemistry, which might alert us of some 
findings that we have overlooked, for example, in myofibromas, if there is no actin expression, there is something wrong or this is something else. In fibromatosis, if we have uniform expression of smooth muscle actin, there is also something wrong because usually we have only patchy expression associated sometimes with desmine as well. Uh, but in desmoid, I just like to see the nuclear beta catenin and uh, the only stain indeed I used to uh, add in desmoid cases occasionally is MAC4 because we have some low-grade fibromyxoid sarcomas in biopsy. They look exactly like uh, desmoid. I recall a case, it was the first case I have seen more than 15 years ago. I missed it as desmoid because it was shown to me by resident as desmoid at that time with beta catenin and went to the central pediatric registry, was confirmed as desmoid. And after 10 years, the patient developed metastasis. He was a child, uh, still living now, maybe almost uh, eight or 10 years later with metastasis. But I think if we, we miss something, in a case of desmoid, then we miss a low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma. Okay, great. And uh, let me ask the, the last question uh, from both lecturers. Um, um, doctor, um, Professor Abbas, do you commonly use um, um, cytogenetic study in your center to uh, make definite diagnosis in your routine practice? Yeah, yeah. yes. Uh, we, we, we have uh, the true site RNA fusion panel from Illumina, which contains 507 genes related to translocations. And uh, I, I, I sign out mainly primarily consult cases, but I supervise the head and neck pathology, the in-house cases, because we are a big head and neck center. And I, I, I request molecular testing either because it is a clear diagnosis, but very rare entity and oncologists frequently like to see this. And when I came to a diagnosis of unclassified, then immediately I will send it to uh, molecular testing, and, uh, but very selectively. So sometimes I say this tumor has a translocation. I don't know what it is but I will check for that. And then really I have seen a few cases recently from head and neck with very uh, interesting translocation, but they do not fit any entity. Still they are cytologically very uniform or they have some unusual immunophenotype. So we use this very frequently. And we recognize even cases of myxoid dermatofibrosarcoma from the angle of the jaw. It looks like some angiomyxoma or something like that, but was surprisingly CD34 positive. So we got back uh, the col one a one fusion. So this is sometimes very helpful. And any case of fasciitis like fibromyxoid lesion presenting at mucosal sites, I send it always for uh, fusion testing because it is unusual to find intraoral uh, fasciitis. So these are frequently similar lesions. And we know that in nodular fasciitis, the exact fusion partner, we usually have USP6 fusion fused to MYH9. Any other unusual fusion partner is likely, is not always, is likely to be associated with aggressive behavior. And there are even old cases of reported, I just have accepted a, a manuscript for virtues archive written by Professor Fletcher on as histologically malignant nodular fasciitis, uh, it has always different fusion partner. And uh, the cases of fasciitis that uh, clinically were aggressive or histologically atypical looking, they always have some odd fusion variants. Therefore, we, we, I, 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 I try to do it uh, relatively commonly. Okay, thank you very much. And the last question, Dr. Safford, do you have uh, any experience with, um, uh, you know, beta catenin biomarkers in your experience? Is it a reliable biomarkers you commonly use in your experience to differentiate fibromatosis or other tumors from uh, sarcomas or not? Um, actually, 
remember, I usually interpret uh, beta ketamine beside other findings. For example, location of the lesion, size of the patient, and um, because you know these days we usually receive needle biopsy. Okay? First of all, we have needle biopsy, and in a needle, small needle biopsy, uh, so uh, lots of the things uh, they are not clear for us. So uh, I first of all I try to. Um, uh, check the um, radiology of the lesion, for example, it's located, where it's exactly, it's exactly located, and age of the patient, because the fibromatosis is, you know, it's very unusual in elderly patients. So uh, it's more commonly seen in uh, young uh, in children, young adults, and before uh, 50 years, I think. And uh, beta catenine can be helpful. Of course, it can be helpful if we see nuclear extension, Characteristic nuclear expression, it can be very helpful. But sometimes, uh, unfortunately, we will encounter non specific cytoplasmic reactions as well uh, that makes the diagnosis somehow challenging. But we have, we have sometimes uh, non specific cytoplasmic reactions. Okay, thank you very much. I would like at the end of the, the webinar, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to both uh, professors. Uh, Professor Abbas and also Dr. Safar, uh, it's very kind of you to take your time for this panel. And I would like to give you, Professor Abbas, this certificate uh, for uh, your invaluable time sharing with us and attendees. Uh, and it's very kind of you. I think it's a very challenging topic. Uh, spindle cell tumors, and uh, we need more uh, time to read and to negotiate on this topic, to learn more. And I would like to thank you again for sharing your brilliant knowledge with, uh, with us. And uh, the next one, please. Dr. Safar, thank you very much. You commonly support us uh, with your uh, brilliant lectures and cases you commonly have in your center. Thank you very much for sharing your uh, experiences. At the end of the panel, I would like to invite all the attendees to uh, stay with us so far to turn on their uh, webcam to have a group photo. I will be very grateful if you would turn on your uh, webcam to have a group photo all of us for memory and uh, my, co my colleague share the link address uh, in the chat box. You can follow us in this uh, link address and you can find the uh, group photo uh, in uh, there. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, much for staying with us so far. Ms. Sadeghi, uh, would you take photos? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very yeah. much. It was my pleasure. And I'm very glad to see that even the topics I have not covered was very nicely covered by Dr. Safar as the myofibroblastic. I stopped just at the nodular FHI. It was the last image <laughs> uh, shown. So this is very interesting topic that is now very clear, I hope, for all of the attendees and I, I, I also have learned a lot from this discussion. Thank you very much. It's very kind of you. Hope to uh, have you in uh, Iran in person, Professor Abbas, and meet you very soon in person. Yeah. Thank you. I, I hope much that this pandemic will have an end soon so we return to normal life hopefully and to fly. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All Thank attendees you. and uh, I do appreciate with uh, you to staying with us. Have a nice day. Have a nice Thank day. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.